Good morning, everyone. My name is Margot, and I'll be doing the introduction in place of Matthew Simmons this morning. We'd like to welcome you to OSA's third panel discussion this year. This one is on trade policy, clipping South Africa's wings. And we'd like to thank you for your interest in this topic and for submitting your questions in advance. This discussion has been co-organized with DNA Economics and will be chaired by the Managing Director of DNA Economics and economist with experience in financial economics, trade and industrial policy, Yash Ramkalawan. Thank you, Yash. Before I hand over to you though, I'd like to do some housekeeping. Firstly, all attendees will be muted and videos will be blocked unless the hosts grant you permission to speak. There are two ways to ask questions. The first is using the Q&A tool. The second is using the hand raising feature. If you opt for the latter, please do give us a moment to switch on your mic before you start speaking. At the end of the webinar, we will be submitting, we will be sending you a feedback form and we will greatly appreciate it if you could pull that out and, pull that out and send it back to us as we really value your input. Right, on to the topic today. So today's topic is on trade policy. Since 2010, various trade measures have been imposed to protect South African producers. While these measures focus on stimulating production and supporting South Africa's economy and achieving its industrial policy goals, less attention is given to how these measures impact consumers and domestic prices. In this webinar, specific attention will be given to three goods, frozen chicken, frozen chips and pasta, because they are relatively important items in the household consumer in the household food consumption bundle, and they account for a combined weight of 14% of the consumer price index. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our chair Yash to introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you, Yash. Okay, thank you very much, Margot. Um, and good morning to everyone. Um, I'd just like to say thank you again to the presenters and panelists. Uh, I think we are extremely privileged today to have participants with such extensive policy, academic and industry experience. So thank you once again. Um, I, I think Margot mentioned already that this is, is quite a pertinent discussion, but I, I think it's especially pertinent given that we are coming through a period of such significant price pressures, um, both SA in SA and globally, and obviously um, exacerbated not only by the COVID-19 pandemic, but also more recently by the Ukraine-Russia war. And so um, understanding how prices are impacted by not only um, supply side issues, but also tariff and trade policy is something I think is very important to understand and discuss. Um, it's, it's pertinent for a number of other re issues, reasons as well, um, including um, increasing pr pressure on policymakers and the Reserve Bank to respond to supply side factors that are often outside of their control. Um, in South Africa, the, the especially topical ones are always electricity and the logistics challenges that we are facing. Um, and then also we are in a period of what some are terming deglobalization. Um, again, especially following the COVID-19 pandemic where uh, there's increased focus on the localization of value chains and, and greater use of protectionist measures um, to protect domestic industries. And so all of this um, are, are factors that influence trade and tariff policy, um, and as we'll see later on in the presentations, impact not only on policy making decisions around trade and tariff policy, but also um, have quite significant welfare implications, um, particularly for consumers on the downstream. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce the presenters, um, first of all, and then our panelists that will provide some additional discussion after the, additional, the initial presentations. Um, Lawrence Edwards will provide the or present the first presentation. He is a professor in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town. He is a researcher um, with the Policy Research on International Services and Manufacturing Unit, um, PRISM, at the University of Cape Town, and is also a research associate at the Southern Africa Labor and Development Research Unit, SALDRU, also based at the University of Cape Town. Um, his research interests fall within the field of international trade and development in Africa, um, and he has extensive uh, publications in that area. 
Um, our second presenter will be Neva Markhetler, um, also with extensive policy and ac academic experience. She is a senior economist at Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies Tips, which is an independent think tank based in Pretoria. Um, she has undertaken extensive research in South African economic issues, published widely, and contributed to a number of national economic policy processes and debates from 1994. Until 2015, she was Deputy Director General for Economic Policy in the Economic Development Department. Before that, she was Lead Economist for the Development Planning and Implementation Div Division at the Development Bank of Southern Africa. She has worked at a senior level in the presidency and other government departments, and for seven years was head of the COSATU policy unit. She has a PhD in economics and before 1994, worked for over 10 years as an economics lecturer. Um, and welcome, Neva, and thank you again for participating today. Um, and then just quickly, our panelists, um, we have three panelists um, that will be joining us after the presentations and that are present at the moment as well. I'll start off with um, Aya Bongo Gawe. He is the Chief Commissioner at the International Trade Administration Commission. Um, he is a Joburg-based development economist, columnist, radio presenter, photographer, very important, and an activist. He's the managing director of a platform involved in advisory facilitation and content development across a wide range of fields. He also hosts Power Business on Power FM and is a regular columnist for Daily Maverick and Business Day. He is also a co-founder of Rethink Africa NPC, a youth-led policy research advocacy and advisory organization, and he has taken part in a wide range of research, advisory, and policy engagements on development issues in agriculture, rail, urban design, and labor market policy. Ayabonga, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we also have Sviso Mklaba, um, Sviso Maslaba, sorry, um, and he is an applied economist with experience in agricultural eco economics, competition and regulatory economics, strategy, policy, and trade analysis, as well as monitoring and evaluation. In May 2021, Sviso was appointed to the board of the National Agricultural Marketing Council. He holds an MSc in Applied Economics from Washington State University and an MBA from the University of Stellenbosch Business School. He was the recipient of a Fulbright Scholarship in 2010 and finalist of the CEO One Day Program in 2019. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, finally, last but not least on the panel is Matthew Stern. He is a director of DNA Economics and heads up the company's trade and regional integration practice and also the company's donor management unit. Prior to founding DN Economics, Matthew worked for the South African Department of Trade and Industry, the National Treasury of South Africa, and the World Bank. His consulting and research interests are in trade and industrial policy and regional integration. He has a MSc in financial economics from the University of London and a PhD in development studies from the University of Sussex. Matthew, thank you again for joining as well as allowing DNA to host. Um, without further ado, I will th then pass on to Lawrence um, to give us a first presentation. Lawrence, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, share my screen quickly here. All right. I think that's, hopefully that's clear to all the uh, participants. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ursa and DNA Economics, for um, organizing this event. And uh, thank you all participants for, for joining in. I think this is a very interesting issue. Um, it works very closely, it aligns very closely with my research interests. And uh, I think this is new areas that we haven't thought about. And I think there's a lot for us to learn and a lot for us all to contribute. And so this process, I think, will help facilitate that. So um, I'm very keen to get lots of comments, discussions, and engagement. And hopefully, we can out of this, we'll build a much more solid understanding of the relationship between trade measures and consumer prices. The paper I'm going to be talking about, the research I'm going to be talking about, is some work that we conducted for the um, South African Reserve Bank, trying to understand the implications of trade policies for inflation. Um, the paper is uh, available as a working paper on the Reserve Bank site, um, so you can have access to that. I think you, we sent the links as well. 
Um, I will present the paper, but this paper is a joint paper. It uh, was um, written together with Godfrey Kamutando, Matthew Stern, who you've been introduced to, for Shea Fenter, uh, Simba Mambara, and Zakira Ismail. Um, so I think they, they will, uh, they're not here, or Matthew can ask the tough que answer the tough questions if there are some that I don't know the answer to. Anyway, so let me move on. Uh, I think it's more to set the context here. Um, if we look over the past uh, 10 or so years, what we're seeing is a rising incidence of tariff and trade measures being used to assist domestic industries. And this, I think, is part aligned with the new strategy that the ITAC or DTIC adopted of strategic trade policy and targeting product level interventions to assist um, domestic industries. What we've seen is increased application by firms and an increased um, number of approvals by ITAC or recommendations that the tariff and trade measure increases be uh, granted um, by ITAC. But what we've also noticed is an, uh, a rise in the, uh, several of incidences where applications or recommendations were rejected. I think most interestingly, for example, in um, August uh, last year, the government suspended the chicken import tariffs, um, or particularly import anti-dumping duties on Brazil and several EU countries, in because the concern by Minister Patel was that this was going to affect um, consumer prices and negatively affect um, the welfare of consumers, particularly poor consumers that consume chicken products. At the same time, we've also recently seen, just in May, um, for example, the increase in anti-dumping duties, or the application of anti-dumping duties, um, on imports from um, Germany, from Netherlands, from Belgium, um, and these duties are up to 239% anti-dumping duties. So there we see two incidences of both um, removal or rejection of inc recommendation increased protection, but as well as increases in, in, in anti-dumping duties being imposed. This has led to, I think, is an enormously contested area. I mean, on the one side, the firms have welcomed the increases in protection um, in the face of increased competition. Um, but on the other hand, consumers and importers have argued that these will be welfare reducing, these are going to raise costs and they're going to negatively affect consumers. And we can see this quite prevalently across the media as well. This also occurs in the context of rising food prices. Um, we may have noticed that uh, in the May report by um, Statistics South Africa, food price inflation was the largest driver of the increased inflation in um, 12 month period from 2022 to 2023 March. And key behind this are meat products as well, including um, poultry products, et cetera. And so we're seeing increases in food prices of around 14% um, per annum. And um, there are large concerns about the negative effect that this um, has on hum consumers. And there are interests about the relationship between tariffs and this food price inflation. Yet when we look at the evidence, there's very little empirical evidence that shows rigorously the relationship between tariffs or trade measures and how these affect consumer prices in South Africa. And we feel this is an important gap. And this what drove the logic behind our empirical work here. So what do we do in this particular paper and analysis? Well, we estimate the impact of the several measures of protection, tariffs, safeguard duties, anti-dumping duties, et cetera, on consumer retail prices. And we focus on frozen chicken, frozen chips, and pasta products, because these are as key consumer products that have faced um, several trade measures over the past 10 years. I'm gonna focus primarily here on frozen chicken and refer to the other products when I, I present the data. Um, we then also look at not only the price effects, but we try and understand how this can affect consumer welfare through the consumption channel. And how do we do it? Well, we estimate the relationship in two ways. The first is we try and understand how tariffs affect the imported price, the landed price of imported goods, the price at the border. And we use very detailed trade level data to try and understand that relationship. But then we also try and understand how the tariff affects the prices that the consumers pay at the retail level. And here we use very detailed data that we obtained from StatsSA um, covering 911 um, retail outlets monthly over the period 210 to 221. So very detailed and rich database to try and understand the retail price implications of these tariff increases. Now, important to highlight the caveats. We focus only in the consumer price story, and this is only one part of the story. What we don't do is we don't understand how the price effects of the tariffs um, are mediated through the value chain from the producer to the consumer. So in particular, who captures the duty rent that we find? 
Is it the importer? Is it the farmer? Is it the wholesaler? Is it the retailer? We don't identify, unpack who captures that rent. And that's an important aspect, I think, for further research. The second is we don't look at the impact on production and employment at all. This aspect is a critical part of the relationship, but we feel that there's been several studies of work done on that, but very little on the price story. So we focus on the price relationship. I'm going to focus on chicken. This is a critical industry in South Africa. It accounts for 16% of gross value added of agricultural products, a significant contributor to employment as well. This is a market that is highly concentrated, five large vertical integrated producers. They account for up to 70% of total production. Two of them account for 50% of production of chicken and um, processed chicken products. Um, the sales are entirely orientated to the domestic market. Very few products are exported. It's also a major source of consumption, poultry products. Um, it's the most, the, considered the most affordable source of animal protein to the South African consumer. It's particularly important for poor households in terms of access to protein. And roughly um, each of us on average in South Africa consumes about 42 kilograms of chicken per year. The demand however, is predominantly for bone in the brown meat chicken cuts. Um, and these are sold individually quick frozen IQF pieces in two to five kilogram bags. These dominate the sale of um, chicken products. When we look at this industry, it's characterized by several changes in the tariff regime affecting domestic producers and consumers. The first key change was in late 2013, following application by a poultry association and its members for tariff increases in the face of import competition, particularly from Brazil, but also increasing from the EU um, that was uh, against which tariffs were being reduced under the free trade area. Now, there's several key issues around the imports of poultry. The first is um, poultry imports are classified across very several different line items. Frozen carcasses, frozen birds, frozen boneless cuts, frozen offal, frozen bone in cuts, etc., and subdivisions within these. And each of these has different levels of tariff protection and different increases in tariff protection. So what we note is that the bone in cuts, for example, tariffs raised were increased from 18% roughly to about 37%. Frozen birds, the tariff increases increased from 27 to 82%. Then again, in 2020, in March, tariff increases on boneless cuts, were, uh, tariffs were further increased on boneless cuts and on bone in cuts from 40 to 42% and 62% um, respectively. So the two incidences where tariffs increased. However, these tariff increases only affected non-preference partners. So they don't affect imports from the EU or SADC or SACU members. They only apply to non-preference members um, and so on. A second key point relating to the use of instruments on tariffs and the same with frozen chicken, frozen chips and um, pasta is tariffs are not the only instrument that have been used to affect imports. Poultry is interesting. There were the MFN tariffs that have been noted, but there are also anti-dumping duties, for example, on the US imports from 2001. Anti-dumping duties were then also imposed provisionally on Brazil and more recently um, in 2022. Then against Netherlands, UK and Germany, and then more recently Poland, Ireland and Spain, those provisional duties were applied, but those were not extended after recommendation that they be um, applied um, um, for the um, for a set duration by ITAC. In addition, from 2017, 16, 17, and particularly from around 2018, 19 onwards, what we've seen are increases in um, safeguards um, applied against EU imports in the in in the face of increased import competition from the EU. And these are specific duties that to protect the domestic industry applied to EU um, um, economies. And finally. What we've seen from 2016 is given the avian flu um, crisis, bans on imports from several countries, particularly the EU um, and so on. So what we've seen over the period 210 is an escalating set of protection measures to protect the domestic industries and protect the industry against, for example, avian flu crisis over time. So MFN tariffs are only one part of the story. So I want to highlight three kind of observations from our relationship. The first is when we look at this, we see that trade measures have a substantial impact on import volumes. They're effective in restricting import volumes from the targeted countries. This data is very complicated, this figure here. This is frozen bone-in chicken, which accounts for around 40% of total chicken imports. 
Um, another 40% is um, mechanically deboned meat, of which tariffs are zero, but we also don't produce that product. So we're going to focus on the dominant product here. And what we can note is from 2010, imports of frozen bone in chicken started to rise. But particularly from 2012, if you look at the orange color, we saw rising in imports from the EU if, as tariffs on those products fell and a shift away from Brazilian imports. We had incidences of the tariff increase in 2013, particularly targeting EU and um, Brazil, and we see declines in e imports from Brazil in response to those tariffs. But those imports have seemed to be replaced by imports from the EU. We then see increases in tariff. We see tariff quotas, for example. Oh, let me come to that later. Um, we see some anti-dumping duties on Netherlands, UK, and Germany in 2014. And what we see is an exit of imports from those goods, but a rise in imports from other EU products. So as measures are imposed in countries, imports shift to alternative sources. And this is very clear in the, in, in, in the data. And we see again in the US quota, in response to fears of losing a go in 2016, it was agreed to allow a set quota, 60,000 or so tons of frozen chicken imports from the US under the tariff regime. So ex exempt from the anti-dumping duties. And then we start to see imports from the US rising as well. The last point I want to point here is as we start to see the safeguards, the avian flu bans, et cetera, being imposed, we see a decline in total aggregate imports from a peak in 2018. And in particular, what we see is a decline in imports from the EU that are targeted from 2022, imports from EU fall to zero because of the avian flu bans. So we see in the decline, by the end of 2021, total imports of frozen bone in are no higher than they were in the early 2010, 2011 period. Um, so the tariffs have effectively and measures of constrained imports. What I wanted to highlight though is a key issue is once the tariffs have been imposed, the MFN duties are imposed on targeted countries like Brazil, there's a sharp response in imports being sourced from the EU or non-targeted countries. And here on the left-hand side, this diagram is just showing you as on the horizontal axis as the tariff on MFN changes, we're seeing, looking at the change in dutable imports on the vertical axis, we can see the larger the increase in the tariff, the larger the fall in imports from Brazil, et cetera, um, of these goods. But at the same time, the larger the tariff increase, the greater the imports of that product are from non-preference countries, or from, sorry, from preference countries or non-dutable um, countries like the EU. So there's a strong substitution effect occurring here. And this is a major concern um, for the poultry industry because um, importers are shifting across um, different sources to evade the tariff. And so we see the same story for frozen chips, many different um, measures, provisional safeguards, anti-dumping duties, final safeguards, then final anti-dumping duties, and more recently, more anti-dumping duties, no changes in the tariffs. And again, when we look at that data, when you impose dumping duties in targeted countries, imports shift to an alternative source like Germany um, and, and so on. So there's lots of substitution and dynamics. A second observation is that the tariff duties raise the border price of imports. There's a strong argument that the has made that the importers bear the cost of the tariff and there's therefore no transfer to imported prices. Well, our data suggests and analysis suggests that when the tariffs are imposed on imports, the price is transferred to the border price completely. Now tariffs are imposed free on board, so um, it excludes insurance and freight, but nevertheless, what we see in this diagram, for example, is the import unit value in the dark blue line without duties. And then if we look at the import duty value, import value inclusive of duties, we see a widening divergence between the two lines over the period. And that divergence rises as these other measures and dumping duties, et cetera, are being imposed. I think the key point I want to emphasize here is what seems to drive the divergence between and, uh, the import price and the import price inclusive of duties is how restrictive alternative sources of imports are. What we can also see is that the consumer price, the index here, the dotted red line, tends to follow the um, import price inclusive of duties. So there's an association we already see between the import price inclusive of duties 
and the domestic consumer price um, relationship. When we estimate this, I'm not going to talk about this um, diagram. The final, another observation we make um, is that we see that the pass through, there's a strong pass through of the tariffs to the domestic consumer prices. In particular, we run several estimates. We look at several different ways. We look at how frozen chicken prices at the retail differ from pork prices as a control. We look at them, how they compare to maize prices because maize is a key input in production. We look at different kind of um, measures to try and understand how prices of chicken move relative to other food products and try and see if those change when we impose tariffs or other particular measures. And in effect, what we find is a pass through around 4.8. In other words, for a 1% increase in the tariff, we find that the domestic consumer price increases by about 0.48 or 0.5%. This is much stronger actually for temporary trade measures like anti-dumping duties and safeguards than it is for um, MFN tariffs. Um, the MFN tariff pass through is 0.3 versus 0.6 for the anti-dumping measures, et cetera. And the one reason is the anti-dumping measures are more effective in restricting access to the import completely. We also found the avian flu bans. Every country that's um, imposed raises prices by about 2.3%, 2 to 3% for each country affected. And we found that the US trade um, quota um, agreement was effective in reducing prices as well. Overall, when we run our estimates and we consider the changes in duties, we estimate that the increase in duties, MFN and all the other duties, raised frozen chicken prices above about 16% from 2012 to 2021, and fresh chicken by about 9.8%. These are not as extreme as some of the importers say, but it's, it's also higher than what um, the Poultry Association often has suggests that the price implications of these tariff duties are. So the key is these duties do pass through to consumer prices according to our estimated data. The final observation, these have strong welfare effects. Um, we find and we look at 2010-11 expenditure data from the income expenditure survey, we see that poor households spend higher shares of the expenditure on chicken, roughly about 14% of their food expenditures on chicken versus around 6 to 7% for the richest households. Pasta and frozen chips are not highly consumed by poor households, but they're consumed by middle income and wealthier households in higher proportions um, than for poor households. The implication is that when we look at the tariff pass through to consumer prices, we find that the chicken tariffs or these duties are aggressive. They adversely affect the welfare or the expenditure of poor households more than the wealthier households because poor households are more dependent on chicken products than um, as a source of consumption. Um, expenditure than, than wealthier households. Uh, on aggregate, the, we suggest, find that we'd estimate about 0.65 of total expenditure, the wealth effect is about 0.65 of total expenditure for households in the lowest decile and about 0.07% um, for households in the top decile. These aren't very large numbers, um, but they nevertheless reflect that um, there's a cost that's disproportionately borne by relatively poor households. And the scattered diagram here is just suggesting the expenditure increase associated with the tariffs against the household expenditure on the horizontal axis. And we can see many poor households have very high cost shocks associated with the tariffs because chicken products is a very high share of their consumption um, expenditure. In addition, we find that larger households, which are more likely to be headed by females and Africans, tend to be more affected by the tariff um, shocks than the others. Pasta and frozen chips were included. These affect the relatively middle, the middle income and relatively wealthy households more so than the poor households. Um, so those are progressive um, rather than regressive in terms of the effects on household, household welfare. So to quickly conclude, we found that exporters and agri don't lower their prices in response to high import duties. The domestic uh, consumers or importers effectively are going to bear a higher cost of the imported products. Those high import products transfer to higher consumer prices on aggregate and with a pass through of about 0.477 for frozen chicken products. So there's a effect of tariffs on consumer prices. These are regressive and disproportionately affect the poorer households, but also a key implication of our results suggests that it's the combination of tariff duties 
and anti-dumping duties and safeguard duties and in the case of chicken avian flu bans it's that combination that ultimately affects the prices individually they don't necessarily have effect but when they applied in combination these barriers restrictions become more binding and have stronger effects on prices and particularly um, they are effective to the extent that the barriers restrict access to imports from preferential trade partners and I think this has got many messages for the implication of trade policy for industrial policy purposes is because the tariff effects are somewhat offset by imports from non-dutable sources and so the effectiveness of tariffs alone in driving industrial policy outcomes needs to take into account the preferential agreements that we're in and the extent to which alternative imports are sourced in response to the tariff increases. I think that's all. Um, so let me move, let me stop over there. Okay, thanks very much, Lawrence. Um, maybe if I just hand over to Margot to see if there's any questions that's that have been received. Um, and if there's anybody that would like to raise a hand uh, to ask any questions of our presenter. I Thanks, don't see Sina. any at the moment. Okay, we've just got one hand raised by Don, Donald McKay. Um, he's welcome to speak. And um, we also, okay, let's do that one first. Um, let's go there. Sorry, um, if, if I could just ask the, the audience um, when they are asking their question verbally um, to just introduce themselves very briefly as well. Thank you. Welcome, Donald. Hello. Um, so I'm Donald Mackay, CEO of XA Global Trade Advisors, um, and also the person that worked on literally every one of the cases, apart from pasta that Lawrence just, um, just spoke of. So firstly, to kind of say my own calculations very closely mirror, mirror yours, Lawrence, uh, regarding the pass through, et cetera. Um, despite, despite representing the importers, I, I, I don't agree with the slightly more hysterical numbers that they've, they've been putting out. I think the, the, connected to this, we should not lose sight of the effect of the AI ban, which I think is is perhaps not properly, um, perhaps pop well understood here, but not more broadly understood. So the in 2017, there was a move by Department of Agriculture to to do a few things with the ban, and one of them was to to alter the requirements to get the ban lifted. And so the, the net effect of that, which gets quite technical, but the net effect of that was to dramatically lengthen the period of a ban even when the avian influenza was lifted. Um, that was a deliberate decision and it's documented, et cetera. But the, so the effect of that was to, even when markets were kind of technically open or should have been open in terms of the law, they were practically kept closed for much, much longer periods. The second thing that happened to kind of coincide with that, although this has eased off a little bit, was to change the inspection protocols when, when the, the containers would arrive at the port. So now you have a much longer period that the AI ban remains in place. And then when goods are arriving, you're holding them at the port for much longer, which is adding a, a fairly significant demurrage cost to the product coming in. You know, so all of this, um, all of this is, is kind of serving the, the same function as a duty, but, but you know, not measured in quite the same way. Um, I, I recall at the time, that we the effect of, of just the delays at the ports had taken an average inspection period from three days to three weeks at one point, um, creating quite a lot of chaos at the Durban port. So the kind of the, the effect on the, the pricing, I, I would agree with the follow through that we, we have, you know, kind of we'd worked out, I think at about 0.49 or something like that, carry through to the price, um, in part because of how it is calculated but also, there, it, it's never going to be absorbed by the suppliers um, for the simple reason that there's, there's a fairly large global market for the product. So there's not a huge incentive for them to, to drop their price to accommodate South Africa. And then it, it is an interesting question as to where the rent sit. So the domestic industry would argue that the, the importers are, are just stashing away cash. 
and not passing any of this through. But I think the more subtle effect is that if you if you didn't have the imports, the price increases would have been more dramatic rather than you would expect, for example, when the anti-dumping duties were not imposed in August last year, um, the, the effect of that would have been that if that had been imposed, prices would presumably have risen quite a bit rather than the fact that you know, we're expecting prices to necessarily come off. So I think the degree of increase is probably um, also subdued, whereas if the import competition was completely removed, uh, the effect would have been greater. And kind of maybe just a last comment, I apologize for rambling a bit, but out of the US, of course, the, the um, concession, the 70 something thousand tons a year that are allowed to enter without the anti-dumping duty are connected to South Africa's ongoing participation within AGOA. And so if that disappears, that concession goes. And so there's an interesting dynamic developing because avian influenza is now moving through South America, which it traditionally hasn't. Um, so if the US goes and Brazil goes, then we, we have a, a really dramatic drop off in the amount of imported chicken and presumably a very large increase in price if the logic of, of the follow through into the consumer price um, is valid. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe we'll, we'll hand straight to Lawrence. Um, there, there are a number of, of points and questions made there. So maybe Lawrence, you can just respond and then we'll, we'll take one or two more questions after that. Yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I don't have too much response because uh, I think there's a comments and I agree with them. I think the, I just wanna highlight the key point is it's, and, and I think um, Donald re-emphasized, it's the combination of these restrictive measures. Um, that matter. It's not just the MFN duty. The MFN duty in 2013 was not very binding because EU access to EU imports was available and there was a substitution towards EU imports. Now, there are price implications because the initial base costs differ. But it's when the ban on the, when the ban anti dumping duties and the safeguard duties on the EU were imposed that suddenly the MFN duty starts to become more binding. And this was really problematic, I think, and I think why Minister Patel didn't apply the anti-dumping duties, although I mean, in late August 2022, um, those applied to Brazil, but any many EU countries, because at that point, EU imports were banned in the avian flu. And if the restrictions on Brazil, the anti-dumping duties on Brazilian importers was imposed, the price effect would have been substantial because the access to alternative sources was constrained. Secondly, the, although South Africa would import from the US, those quota free import duty, anti dumping um, duty free imports quota had been fulfilled. So any additional imports from the US, sorry, from the US would have then be subject to the very high 925 cents per kilogram um, or something duty um, as well. So we're in a market where access to imports is super constrained. And I think the price effects of duties and the combinations will be amplified in this constraint. And this, I think, is one reason why we look in 2023, the first six months of this year or five months of the year, the value of imports is very low. It's lower than it was in 2011. And so we've seen imports have really dramatic, or frozen bone in have really dramatically fallen as access to alternative sources has been restricted. And the price effects, I think, will start to bind of, um, of these duties will be binding. Um, in these circumstances. So I agree on these points. I agree, uh, well, well uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, Margot, if, if you don't mind, uh, what I would suggest is uh, just also cognizance of time. Maybe we'll just see if there's any other hands. Um, I think that I see one more, so, so maybe we'll take Sorry. that question. Okay. Um, and then Lawrence, if, if, if you don't mind, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, rather than responding to them live, uh, I'll just ask you to just type in your answers in response. Um, uh, so, so um, Margot, maybe just over to you for the, the hand that's been raised. Great. So this is Isaac Breitenbach. Um, good afternoon. Yes, I'm um, Isaac Breitenbach and I'm from the South African Poultry Association. Um, I, I would like to make a comment, but also um, ask uh, some questions. 
I think the, uh, the the position of the South African Poultry Associations is that we are absolutely not against any imports. Um, BFAP, in collaboration with Wageningen University, found this industry to be totally globally competitive. Um, we can compete with Brazil at undumped prices, with the US on undumped prices, and, and the same with the European Union. But what we are competing with is dumped product. Um, and let me give some um, relevance to that. Um, the the, the, the uh, pr producer uh, production cost currently is 30 Rand 50. And when we have chicken coming in from Brazil at nine Rand and never find that in the marketplace, that's dumped chicken. And, and no country can, can compete with that. And certainly the WB, uh, WTO said that that is unfair trade and it should be eliminated. Um, I think that that will give us uh, our position. What I would like to ask Lawrence is that um, when I look at the presentation, obviously we can see the increases and decreases in price relative to, 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 ta to tariffs. How did they um, cater for the impact of feed, which is 70% of our input cost and has got a 93% pass through rate? Um, to consumer prices, specifically in the last, um, since June last year. And then secondly, the, the total impact of load shedding. If we look at the pass-through rate, and we've got uh, work done through Genesis Analytics that will be in the media tomorrow, um, we found on the Brazil and four European countries um, anti-dumping duty, a pass-through rate of between 0.9% and 4.9%. Um, so the question is, how did they cater for feed and load shedding? And, um, and why didn't the prices come down when the provisional duty uh, was lifted um, last year? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I think these are great questions. Very interesting. I, I think there's several issues that are, are raised here. And um, as highlighted, I mean, the, the WTO accounts and allows for unfair trade measures uh, or trade measures to deal with unfair competition, and one of which is anti-dumping duties. And all institutions like ITAC and governments like ITAC have the right and the obligations, and I think they should use these measures to cater for, um, to offset anti-dumping, offset dumping that occurs. And so when there's evidence of dumping, we have the right to use anti-dumping measures, but that's not the same as an MFN tariff. The MFN tariff has nothing to do with anti-dumping duties. So when the state applies for an increase in, the, or, or SARP or anyone applies for an MF, increase in the tariff rate, that's unrelated to dumping. So the anti-dumping argument cannot account for the MFN tariff, which is 62% on frozen bone in chicken. So that's a different argument that is not answered by the argument that there is dumping being imposed. So I think there's an important separation that is not sufficiently highlighted in the debate around this. And so I would ask, what's the merit of the MFN tariff and the validity of the MFN tariff, which is not an anti-dumping argument? I think the anti-dumping merit stands on its own. It, it, I agree with you 100%. Um, I do think there needs to be solid mechanisms of identifying the base prices and understanding what's driving these as well um, as part of that process. So I think I just want to highlight that important distinction in the, in the debate. The second key issue I think is to highlight is we don't look at the precise transmission. In that. We look at the retail price as an end and we compare the retail price against alternative meat products and alternative producers also face many of these constraints like electricity, load shedding, um, um, feed price increases. And what we note is that the price of the chicken product rises relative to these alternative sources of meat products when the duties are imposed. And that's how we identify that the duty has an effect on chicken or poultry products relative to other meat products. We also include that relative to the retail price of maize products. And that's a measure of the control for the cost point that you that was raised and is very important because poultry is processed maize to some extent and so even when we look against retail price of maize product which is a control for the cost dimension 
maize cost dimension, we still find the pass-through effect. So I think our results are robust to this, uh, these other cost controls that you're talking about. I think this raises a very important third point though, is MFN duties and anti-dumping duties are not necessarily effective in dealing with these very important cost constraints that poultry producers and other producers in South Africa are facing, high municipal costs, inefficient access to water, electricity constraints, high transport cost problems. All of these non-traded input costs raising the cost of production in South Africa and adversely affect the ability of poultry producers but all other producers to compete against foreign importers. But the issue here is, the question we need to think about is, and I'm going to go back to the MFN tariff, is the MFN tariff the correct measure to resolve those problems? Because while it's an implicit subsidy to the producer, it's an implicit tax on the consumer. And more importantly, it doesn't target the very specific supply constraint problems that are giving rise to the competitiveness problem faced by those firms. So it's not an efficient instrument to deal with the problems. And so I think we need better ways to think about resolving some of those problems in, in, which, in, in a world in which firms can compete against importers and consumers can bear the benefits of competition through the form of lower prices. Um, so I think we need to rethink our use of tariff instruments to achieve some of these instruments, particularly to generate competitive industries in the future. Thanks very much, Lawrence. I, I, I mean, that, that last point is probably the most pertinent um, uh, in terms of tariff policy or, or tariff in, as an instrument of, of industrial policy and alternatives, given a lot of these issues are structural and systemic in nature rather than related to kind of broader trade integration issues. Um, um, what I want to do is, is just ask the audience. Um, uh, I'm very cognizant of time and I, I want to give both the next presenter and the panelists enough time to to respond to some of the issues that have been raised. So uh, can we move directly on to, to Neva's presentation, please? Um, Neva, over to you. Um, if there are any other questions for Lawrence and the presentation, please just put them into the Q&A um, and I'll ask that Lawrence responds to them as, as we're going through today. Thanks very much, over to you, Neva. Okay, so um, I should say that I actually did this paper about four years ago. So, well, three years ago, it was finished. Also for the Reserve Bank. Um, and so I've only updated one or two of the slides, although I've updated some of the commentary. And it's definitely less rigorous than um, DNA's input. Um, basically, I was just looking at tariffs on basic foods and how they've evolved, but also trying to get at some of the impacts. And I do think one of the questions that comes from all of this is how do we think about what impacts are important? And now I'm not able to, it's the next slide, there we go. And I just to say, this is using World Bank data, but what it shows is that average tariffs in South Africa sort of reached their bottom point in 2014. Since then they've tended to climb um, and food prices in particular have tended to climb. Um, although they're still far lower than they were in the early 2000s. And I just want to flag that the master plans for poultry and sugar also seem to anticipate significant tariffs for the foreseeable future. And that I think what's important is given that food is a staple food product, that food tariffs tended to move with other tariffs. Um, they've only been lower than other tariffs, the weighted average, in four years from 2000 to 2020. And the question that we were, I was asking in the paper is why was this the case, given that, you know, it's useful to have the, the detail we just heard, but the fact is we know that food power tariffs tend to increase the price of food. Um, and they also therefore have some impact on monetary policy by putting a floor under some prices. So what I did in the paper was just to say, can we look at some of the impacts, particularly on low income households, and then some of the mechanisms that I think this is, um, what I'm going to spend most of the input on. Uh, what are the mechanisms that lead, you know, the systemic decision making systems that lead to um, this kind of decision to have these quite substantial tariffs on basic foodstuffs? I will say that part of the problem is, as I think has come out of the previous discussion, the data on a lot of agricultural subsectors is weak compared to the data on manufacturing 
for reasons that have to do with the way the um, statistical system emerged. Okay, so I think what's important, and it did come out of the previous discussion as well, is that tariffs, you know, there are pros and cons to every tariff. There are winners and losers, but also the impacts change over time. In a democracy, you would expect that any tariff, anybody who supports a tariff is going to say, somehow it benefits the majority, at least in the long run. But there's also a lobbying problem, that it's very hard to avoid policy measures where the costs for the majority are broadly spread and often intangible, but the benefits to, the, to a minority are large and visible because the minority will then lobby heavily while the majority is often not even aware in a very concrete way of the impact on them. And this is obviously the reverse of the argument around trade and environmental policies where often the costs are targeted and the benefits are diffuse and the result is that it's very hard to get those measures through. And you know, the cost of a tariff are obvious, it's what we're talking about. They raise the price to consumers and users. I do think we need to be clear if we're talking about how to shape a tariff policy about the potential benefits. And the critical argument is that they can save investment in jobs in non-competitive industries. And I just wanna flag something, that BFAP finding about the efficiency of poultry actually relates only to the efficiency with which feed is converted into poultry weight. It doesn't relate to overall productivity and cost. So I think it's important to say that because there may be other areas where efficiency could be improved. But it's also to avoid import dependency for sensitive products such as medicines or arms. Some people argue, for instance, we need to maintain the wheat industry, even if that requires higher prices on bread, which is now as important in low income diets as um, maize, because we don't want to be dependent, you know, fully dependent on imports for a staple product. I think everybody here will agree that the argument that economists generally like best is that tariffs can give local producers time to adapt to new foreign competition or to develop new products that will become competitive. And as we said, to prevent dumping, although dumping is often in the eye of the beholder. And I think we need to be clear about what actually constitutes dumping, particularly with poultry. It's, it's a somewhat contested definition. Again, it's easier to support these measures if it's a short-term thing that will lead to long-term competitiveness you're not just supporting an industry that will never be able to compete with imports. But as we said, even if you look at the costs and benefits objectively, and it seems like the costs outweigh the benefits, you often have very strong lob lobbies and a limited voice for the majority. And that's a problem when it comes to staple foods. Working class consumers are generally not well organized. And that means the discourse about even the impacts on consumers tends to be biased towards high income products such as finance or petrol or housing. We don't talk as much about the impact of increases in basic foods, unless like what happened right after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, they go through the roof. And it's interesting that if you look at the master plans, which again, rely heavily on tariffs as one of the measures proposed, you don't have representatives of consumers in the engagements outside of the elected political leadership. Um, and so what I was saying is, we all know South Africa is unusually unequal by global standards. Um, and that we need to understand that inequality in terms of four groups, the poorest 30%, who tend to be largely dependent on social grants and informal work, um, and disproportionately in the former so-called homelands or labor setting areas. The next 30%, which is like the low end employed group, they have stable employment, but it doesn't pay well. Um, after that, you get into what is really the formal working class um, in the following 30%, and then the top 10% of households. And, the reason these groups are important for this discussion is you can see the share of food in their budgets. You know, for the poorest group is 33%, for the formal top end of the formal working class is 10%, for the richest 10%, it's only 5% of their expenditure, but it accounts for 20% um, of all food sales and 45% of other consumption. So when we say a product is important for consumption in South Africa, it's often only important for that top 10% because their incomes are so much higher than other groups that they just dominate household consumption. So what I was trying to do in this paper is say, but let's look at the impact on say the poorest 60% um, of households of these kinds of tariff measures. And in that context, 10 foods accounted for two thirds of food expenditure by the poorest 60%. It was half for the formal working class, but these products were less than a third for the richest deciles. Of those, the four largest were chicken, bread, maize meal, and sugar. 
Um, and of those top 10 foods, poultry, wheat, beef, sugar, and cooking oil all had tariffs that were above the average, the weighted average that is, for South African tariffs in 2020. They ranged from over 50% for poultry and sugar to 10% for cooking oil. And those products accounted for over 40% of food consumption by the poorest 60% of households. So if you look at all households, the household, the 60% of households with the lowest income, you know, were facing particularly high tariffs on their food. Because that compared to 36% of consumption for the formal working class and 24% for the highest decile. Maize, rice, milk, and potatoes did not have import tariffs in 2020, uh, mostly because South Africa is essentially self-sufficient. And the graph just shows, um, you, can, you can see the share of the, the, the level of the tariff is what's in the circle in 2020, the main tariff, as we've heard, there are several different tariffs. But you can see that the share of consumption outside of beef is, in all of these, is higher for the poor 60% by quite a lot than it is for higher income groups. So... One of the issues, though, why food is easy to tariff is because agricultural products are mostly excluded from WTO rules. So WTO rules do strictly limit tariffs. They don't apply to most agricultural goods. South African sugar and wheat tariffs set a floor and import prices. They kick in whenever an international reference price falls. So the argument is we don't want to be undercut by international suppliers. So South African consumers will have to help pay for a tariff to maintain the price at the desired level for sugar and wheat. The poultry tariffs were designed to prevent import surges, that is, to, you're allowed to have these things to stabilize the industry, but also to prevent dumping. And dumping here is meant in a quite specific sense in most cases. That is, the argument is if foreign producers are selling brown meat that is lakes and thighs to South Africa more cheaply because they see it as a byproduct of dressed meat, which is favored in the global north and gets a higher price that we will consider that dumping as opposed to a sale of byproducts. Um, there are also longstanding duties on beef and cooking oil that go back to the 1990s. And as we've heard, all of these tariffs have exclusions under bilateral agreements, but sometimes we nonetheless see dumping duties as most recently with, with poultry. So what are the impacts? Well, they stabilize agricultural prices for producers in the hopes that they will maintain and possibly even expand production and ultimately ideally become more competitive. Now, to be clear, there is a thing about agricultural prices often have stabilization mechanisms because the argument is changes in the weather. You don't want all your farmers to leave a particular product because there's a drought or a heavy rainfall. So you try and stabilize the price. I think the policy question here is how much are we prepared to pay to maintain local production of these products? In sugar, the argument is we have to sustain smallholders in sugar, but honestly, the number of smallholders who are actually engaged in sugar production tends to be vastly exaggerated. There's far more who are licensed than who actually produce it, and it's only a tiny share of total production. And then again, the argument is we need to retain local production of wheat and cooking oil. Southern hemisphere production of wheat tends to be higher cost than northern hemisphere production of wheat. So if there isn't a tariff, we would likely end up being fully import dependent. Cooking oil, there's an argument. You can import very cheap palm oil from overseas. It could displace local uh, cooking oil production if it's not protected. But as we've heard, there are costs. And the costs are, tariffs are in fact designed to raise the price for these foods in the short run at least. Arguably, you end up with a misallocation of agricultural land and water to uncompetitive producers. Because of course, in most cases, the land and water could, in South Africa could be used for other crops. So the question is, how important is it to maintain local production, which again depends in part on whether those crops can in fact in the longer term become competitive. Um, but if they can't become competitive, how important is it strategically for us to maintain our own supply of those crops rather than producing substitutes that might possibly use that land and water more efficiently? And of course, it enables the large poultry companies to avoid adapting to the new realities, which is um, they need, if they, in order to compete with foreigners, for instance, with foreign companies, they would have to find ways to cut their costs. They would have to grow larger chickens um, and they'd have to look more to export markets. And it's not clear if South Africa can ever achieve the economies of scale you see in places like Brazil, not just on um, chicken production, but also on soy production. So part of the issue is we're having import parity pricing for soy. We have not made any real attempt to bring the price down to cost plus, 
which would reduce the price of feed for poultry, um, as opposed to putting tariffs. And this is just a chart that shows that the prices for tariff goods tended to rise faster than other goods. Um, but we've kind of heard more detailed information on that. You know, if we look at the political economy of food tariffs, you know, what is unusual about South Africa is that unlike other upper middle income countries, we are heavily dependent on a few relatively small number of large commercial farmers, 45,000 currently, about a third of them are now black, as well as some very large processing companies like the sugar and grain millers and the poultry companies. We are actually an outlier amongst upper middle income countries in that we rely on very high tech commercial farming with very high productivity per worker compared to other countries and per hectare. And we have almost no smallholder or subsistence agriculture. And what that means is you have very well organized and capacitated farmers and processors who are able to undertake lobbying and media campaigns. If you've ever seen stuff by this thing called fair trade, you'll know what I mean. Um, but also who are able to engage on agreements around the sectors which say in order to avoid job losses and promote transformation, largely in the sense of black ownership um, of production, you have to give us tariffs to stabilize the industry is the common argument. And I'd be interested to hear what Aya Bonga has to say about that in his new position. And so from this standpoint, you can see the increase in tariffs is compensating for the elimination of other supports for commercial farmers in the mid 1990s when they were pretty much scrapped overnight. Um, a lot of that was about price stabilization and, and other kinds of protection. And in some ways the new tariffs are reinstating that kind of protection. And you should just maybe contrast these products to horticulture, which is very export dependent, and where we've seen very rapid shifts between the kinds of products they grow, the kinds of crops they grow, and the technology they use as demand and comp competitive conditions change. Um, you know, now they're working at a smaller scale in a higher value add industries. We, we, it's not a perfect analogy, but it does suggest there are other strat strategic approaches. A second way of understanding this is in terms of ITAC decision-making systems and how they deal with tariffs. And so from the mid 2010s, as we've heard, ITAC said we need a developmental trade policy, which would provide higher protection for local producers where there is dumping by foreign countries, where there are destabilizing import surges and where foreign producers get subsidies. And these are of course all, you know, permitted, these are, this is where the WTO permits tariffs in effect. So they're just really reflecting the WTO approach. But they also argued that in agriculture, firstly, we need to offset state support to farmers, especially in the global north, but also in Brazil, where it's not so much in the form of subsidies as in a huge range of other kinds of support, such as infrastructure, R&D, and so on, on a very large scale. They also argued that farmers are price takers in food value chains. I'm not totally sure that's entirely true in South Africa because we are so dependent on commercial farmers. Um, relative to other developing countries. Also, as we said, there's fluctuations in global prices which can destabilize the industry. And they do say they need to take into account the impact on consumers and in particular the poor in their ter terminology. But in practice, they didn't actually give evidence to say, how did these things justify the specific tariffs they imposed? And in particular, they were very vague about the impact on working class communities. So for instance, when they, you know, vastly increased the poultry tariff in 2019. There was no published cost benefit analysis. There may have been one, but it wasn't published. They said they'd commissioned a study by the Agricultural Marketing Commission, but they didn't publish the study or its main conclusions. They did say consumers might bear costs, but they didn't public, they didn't publish the quantification of the cost or benefits of the tariff, including the cost to consumers. They do have hearings on these things, but what that tends to mean is, you know, when you have a hearing where you just say anybody can come and talk, um, you end up with business associations doing most of the talking. They didn't proactively go out and get consumer inputs as far as one can tell. And if you've ever looked at any list of participants in this kind of hearing, you'll have, you know, a very long list of business associations and COSATU and maybe one or two consumer associations, and that's about it because of who has the resources to engage. So what would help, I would argue, firstly, food tariffs should always be reviewed rigorously and the existing tariffs should be reviewed rig rigorously, not just potential ones. 
in terms of the impact on working class households, as well as in terms of the benefits to producers, that we need to balance those things much more carefully and not just assume that somehow the costs can be absorbed by households. Staple food tariffs should be contingent on holding domestic price increases to inflation at best. And that's something we've actually seen in the sugar master plan where the producers have committed to holding price increases to inflation for the next three years. ITAC should really publish the details of its cost benefit analyses and they should specifically try to quantify the cost to low income households. And particularly for wheat and poultry because they are staples, we need to review the strategies that are currently in existence to say, can we find an end state where they no longer continuously rely on tariffs to survive? that we can't continuously say we're going to increase the cost of living for working class households because we want to have local production of chicken and wheat. So, we are Boha. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neva. Again, just cognizant of time and, and especially wanting to give um, our panelists that do have time commitments past one o'clock to, to respond to some of the issues that have been raised. But maybe we'll just take one one or two questions. You know, why don't um, we let Ayamala talk at least? Because I've said a lot about ITAC and I think it would be useful. No? Yeah, sure. sure. So I, I don't see any hands raised, um, which is probably a good thing. So we can go straight to the um, panelists. Uh, if there are any questions for Neva that anybody wants to ask, please feel free to um, put them into the Q&A chat box. Um, so over to our First panelist, um, what, what I will do is give each panelist uh, a little bit of time to respond to the issues that have been raised. Uh, we'll start with Ayabonga um, and then on to Sviso after that. Um, and then last but not least, again, Matthew, uh, we'll, we'll leave you for, for the last input on the first round. Um, Ayabonga, obviously, Neva has raised a, a number of political economy type issues, but also issues that are very pertinent for ITAC in terms of, of balancing interests, um, transparency in the process, um, and, and how to make the overall tariff setting process a little bit um, fairer, for lack of a better word. Um, so I'll, I'll pass straight over to you to, to provide your inputs and thoughts um, around these issues that have been raised. Yeah, well, thanks, Yash. Um, and I see Neva's quite agitated to um, get me on behalf of ITAC to respond to much of what has been said. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's great to be at an at a Economic Research Southern Africa platform. Um, just over a decade ago, I was a scholarship recipient of ARSA, so uh, I think it's great to, to see ARSA continuing to be part of the public discussion on many of these important issues. Um, let me maybe just say a few things. Um, and I think the one is, is to just maybe share my observation about um, the very helpful inputs that the two colleagues have made, um, you know, both uh, Neva and um, Professor Edwards, um, in really giving us over the last decade or so, I guess, a historic view, and maybe on the political economy questions, probably a much longer term view, uh, Neva, on what gives rise to this relative, you know, imbalance in power and ability to participate in some of the processes that give rise to these outcomes. Um, I do want to say, though, just as we start, that um, I think we're batting on the same wicket in relation to this acknowledgement that there are price raising effects of all manner of trade policy. And I think the discussion is trying to shift us in a direction where we are looking at to what degree do we manage these trade offs and from a sequencing perspective and even targeting and prioritization, uh, what we do first and what subsequently follows. I think that that is important. Um, and certainly that's why I say this discussion is very helpful and rather constructive. Just a few things I'd like to say. Maybe let me start um, and speak to this question of the evolution of policy, because I do think that a lot of the things that are being mentioned um, have certainly been shifted and influenced by the passage of time. I mean, let me just make the example on, on, on the wheat tariffs that um, Neva speaks to. We certainly have seen uh, over the last while, probably since about... Um, yeah, the end of 2021 or so, um, the effective tariff um, due to the variable pricing formula, the effective tariff on wheat um, sitting at around 0% or so. And a lot of that has to do with price shifts that have happened in that market, uh, because the nature of how that instrument works is that there's a significant 
uh, interface between where global prices are in relation, I guess, to the protection that domestic producers should get. Um, so that's one example. But there are probably a few other examples where I think the historic perspective, while helpful, um, would probably benefit from engagement with some of the things that have happened in the recent while. Um, the first one is, I think, a significant policy shift. So if, if you look at, from a trade policy perspective, where we were in the early 90s, where the big part of the focus was saying, yes, we want to increase manufactured exports, we want to manage uh, sequentially a tariff liberalization process, uh, we want to make sure SMMEs get into key export markets, and of course, we want to improve the competitiveness and productivity of domestic industry. But if you fast forward to probably post-2015 or so, uh, the Ministerial Directive on uh, Customs Duty Amendments uh, effectively tried to start this process of ensuring that tariffs don't blunt the competitive pressure uh, that import competition gives rise to in the domestic market. And the implication, of course, that has on downstream prices, not just for consumers, but even for industrial users. Uh, and I've found some of the inputs from the colleagues, certainly on pricing behavior and in intermediate input industries, quite important and quite instructive. Um, this issue of conditionalities, I think also comes up in the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Um, and similarly in the trade policy direction from 2021, um, it explicitly sets out that we don't want tariffs to apply of pressure that otherwise, uh, you know, would arise, um, you know, if we don't go through this process of the impacts uh, distributionally on different actors. So, so I'll do that, uh, maybe just as the first point. I think the second one is, I think we are in agreement. There's considerable amount of things that ITAC from a process perspective could qualitatively improve upon. So, so I'm not here to try and, you know, play a holding role as a night watchman and say, hey, I just got here and, you know, there's not much we can do, not at all. Um, and I think there is a frank admission, certainly on our part, um, and even, uh, you know, on the part of uh, the department who interfaces a lot with our work, um, that we have to make sure that in terms of process that we improve how our work unfolds. One is, of course, in relation to the quality of the consultative process, who is there, who is not there. Um, and while not making a commitment to improve the consumer advocacy landscape, which I think needs significant amount of work in South Africa, uh, I think the challenge is to say to us, you know, which other voices ideally should we proactively be getting to the table? And I certainly, I think I'm, I'm on the same song sheet with Niva on that particular score. So too, um, I think, would I give a receptive ear to the political economy observation about, you know, the history of agriculture, this kind of duality in agriculture, I think, and even, of course, the decimation of the peasantry and the implication of that uh, on the market structure of many of the product markets where we get these staples. I think we can agree on that. But I think the point that we also need to underscore here is we cannot resolve all of these market structure and welfare related issues by solely looking at the instruments at the disposal of our trade policy elements of industrial policy, because that's just but one element. I think a big part of what we need to talk about here, yes, trade policy matters, but we need to have that as part of a deeper agrarian and agro-industrial discussion, uh, which is able to look at a few things. The one is this interface between our agricultural policy. And when I say this, I don't mean in relation to just the research, but even issues of standards, regulation, SPS issues, and all of that, alongside you know, land use and resource allocation. I think Neva was touching on this question. Um, but also, I guess, how all of this fits into the industrial policy questions that we're talking about. I mean, one of the big challenges, if one looks at the census on commercial agriculture over a long period, certainly over the last two decades or so, one gets a sense that in many critical product markets, um, we haven't over time increased the share of staple products that are produced at a farm gate that end up in two particular channels of interest. One in the export channel, and the second one, of course, in the processing channel. Um, and so a big part of our focus here is certainly on the um, pass through of freight on board prices to retail prices. And I do think in our consideration of the domestic industry, some of the things we're thinking about on conditionalities is to what degree can we expand uh, exports? Can we also expand the share of farm gate production that ends up 
uh, processed. And just on this question of exports, I think it's important because if we speak about the competitiveness of the poultry industry alongside some of the markets it competes with, we, we often tend to just only talk about consumer preferences, so white versus bone in meat, um, and many other matters, you know, avian flu, you know, diversion and all manner of things. And seldom does the discussion focus on this question of what are some of the measures, both trade and others, that we can institute to begin to improve the export footprint and the new markets that our industry can produce in order to get the scale economies that we're looking at. I certainly don't have as pessimistic a prognosis as Neva has on this question, uh, but I do think there is a need for much greater complementarity of some of the measures that uh, we're looking at here. Maybe then just the last comment. I think there are certain procedural and process related things that um, we are undertaking in order to try and deal with some of these institutional and political economy issues that, that Neva was raising. And of course they do interface certainly to the point Professor Edwards was making on MFN tariffs. Uh, he would certainly know that uh, uh, by ministerial directive about uh, two years ago, or just uh, over, a, yeah, just about two years ago, 18 months to about two years ago, um, there's a review that has been instituted. And of course, once that is concluded, we, we will certainly be in a position to communicate on it. That is aimed at making very specific recommendations around what type of tariff regime do we want uh, for this product market. Um, and I think that that, while focusing just on tariffs, has to interface and, and engage with some of the other, you know, remedy instruments that we have at our disposal to make sure that at least there's some complementarity in how we are doing this, uh, so that the, the questions of how these land in markets and of course in households, um, you know, uh, is something that uh, we certainly have line of sight over. I think the second thing also is around, you know, Neva makes this point, um, and I'd be interested to hear what Donald thinks about this, um, that our processes are highly formalistic and legalistic. And this is the last comment I want to make. Um, and in so doing, it gives rise to an opportunity for the process to be largely driven by consultants. We also have in some markets uh, where people will say, look, we can't come to you because we don't have the money you know, to put up uh, to get consultants and so on. Uh, and I think a big part of our work going forward is certainly to give true effect to, to the provision in the Act, in the ITA Act Section 22 1B, which places an obligation on us, um, of course, resources and capacity permitting, um, to make sure that we provide advice to industry and many other interested parties, and I would in include consumer advocacy groups here, to be able to engage meaningfully in our process and where they need some form of institutional uh, I guess, relief or institutional support arising from the instruments we have at our disposal, that we are able to assist them in that process. And I think, uh, you know, part of some of the reforms that are underway, not only to, you know, amendments to the act, amendments to the regulations, but even instituting regulations where none exist to try and give effect uh, to this function, I think is, is an area of significant institutional um, institutional change for us at the moment. So let me pause there, Yash, um, and maybe I guess if I get another opportunity, we can speak to some of the more, uh, I guess, um, econometric and political economy questions. But I just wanted to touch uh, at, on those issues institutionally and say that indeed we've made some advances on this question of, um, you know, considering price. Um, and I think uh, many would know on this call uh, to what degree that is part of what we expect on reciprocity and conditionalities. Um, and so our view is that certainly not just on tariff instruments, but even in other instruments, we're quite alive to this question of the implication on consumer prices and even prices for industrial users downstream. Thanks. Perfect. Th thanks very much, Ayabonga, for being um, so positive and receptive to some of uh, Neva's agitations. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to touch on some of the points that Ayabonga raised. Uh, I, I want to pass straight on to, to Sviso, who has a, a hard stop of, of 1 p.m. Um, Sviso, I, uh, I'll allow you to just provide, the, obviously, your, your, your general response to some of the issues that have been raised. Um, I'd, I'd be particularly interested to just hear your take on, the, there's an obvious tension between tariffs, uh, the feed through into prices, um, uh, and obviously the, the impact that it has on uh, affordability uh, on, of food for especially some of 
um, consumers in the, in the lower end of the income brackets. The other side of the coin, um, and speaking from an industry perspective, you might have some thoughts on this, is around food security um, and the role that trade and industrial policy plays in ensuring food security, especially given the, the global dynamics. So, so maybe I'll, I'll pass on to you and just pro provide your, your general thoughts. Thanks. Yes, um, thanks very much for the opportunity and the invite. I think the discussions so far have been quite useful and insightful. And thanks to, to the speakers and Aya for touching on some of the points. I think, yes, as you said, I'll provide a perspective also from industry and maybe just to say I, I am involved in the sugar industry. Uh, so certainly I'll have some thoughts and comments around um, the, the points that never concluded on. And maybe to start on that, yes, I think uh, Neva is quite correct. I think they we've been implementing phase one of the master plan for the last three years. And one of the commitment was to restrain prices at CPI, inflation. However, yes, what we've observed is I think you know, controls on prices are quite distortive in nature, especially when you cannot control the input costs. I think over the last two years, whilst implementing the master plan, we've seen significant increases in input costs and thereby rendering you know, the, the farmers and the millers unable to recover costs because of that commitment. I mean, as a country, we import about 80% of our annual fertilizer and about 98% of agrochemicals, fuels, and equipment. And of course, I think the, you know, the developments in Russia and the disruption in the value chain had a huge impact on fertilizer prices going up as high as um, 200%. And, and if you zoom in into the industry, because of this commitment, you've had an additional million company go into business rescue because it simply cannot be done. So I do think that you know, trying to impose a restriction on prices when you don't have the ability to impose or control input costs is, is quite dangerous. And I think maybe yes, um, linked to that, I mean, I think the point has been made that we can consider trade and industrial policy as separate and mutually exclusive. Um, we certainly need to, I think in my view, use trade uh, policies to allow industries to, to, to compete, to allow industries to become efficient and uh, you know, increase their co uh, competitiveness. I think Isaac made the point that most industries are able to compete. I think the issue is when you're competing against unfair trade, from you know, um, you know, the guys exporting towards you. And if you look at, for example, in the sugar industry, if you look at Brazil, you know, they've got fundamental subsidies that is not direct uh, price support, but it is policy support that allow them to diversify and therefore can switch between the fuel and sugar markets and essentially control the price. And I think we need to have that approach where in at least short to medium term, we allow the, the trade protection, but ensure that uh, industrial policy then comes in to ensure that the industries diversify and the industries are able to increase competitiveness and compete globally. Otherwise, we will, if, if we look at trade without understanding you know, how the un level of unfair trade that is coming external is going to impact the country. And I think, yes, just to go to food security, I mean, the, the points around um, you know, the, the trade or the 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 the, you know, the pass through to consumers is well made. I certainly think that needs to be taken into account. But I think where the studies may you know may have missed some of the argument is around the ability of the trade to allow farmers to create jobs. And in most of the instance, the jobs created in the farms are actually jobs that are for perhaps people with low skills and therefore it does benefit um, the poor as well. So you need to have a balance between the two. And I think just lastly, I mean, never spoke to the issue of understatement or exaggeration of uh, production in the industry by small scale growers. Um, and and um, I think the numbers are currently standing between 10 to 13%. But what is also missed in this discussion is that you know, small scale growing or subsidence farming is actually an intergenerational household generating, um, wealth generating asset. Um, and it exists in areas where very limited opportunities are able to be found and that does need to be protected. But surely then the question is, should it be protected at all costs? Certainly not. 
And I'm of the view that over the long term, any protection that is given to any industry needs to be mindful of that. And the industries should be able to show progress from the day of receiving the protection to the next time there is a, an application. And I think um, I attached on the reciprocity commitments um, where industries need to show fundamental change and they need to speak to issues of you know, research development, technological advancement and supporting the farmers. And, and I think that's there already. I think that's happening and it can certainly be improved, but it is there. And I think, yes, just lastly, you know, as, as the agriculture sector, we are on, on a journey to implement the agriculture and agro-processing master plan. And I think the master plan uh, is both is focused on increasing food security, but also in improving access to local and export markets, which require constant upgrades. And I think there's an understanding across all social partners that we need a collaborative approach um, to ensure that we're able to reach these goals. And in order to do so, you need a stable and protected sector that contributes to sustainable development, inclusivity in the farming value chain, but also improves cost competitiveness going forward. I think that you, yes, those are my initial comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fisa, and, and, and thanks for bringing in, um, I guess, what is quite a different industry perspective on, on the various issues that have been raised. Um, Matthew, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Um, obviously, you, you're free to, to respond in whatever direction you want to, but, but I'm most interested, I guess, from your side to, to get your take and perspective on something that we haven't heard too much today, which is around the, the regional issues um, and kind of policy impacts arising from South African trade and tariff policy, particularly, for example, in the SACU market. Um, but over to you. Cool. Well, afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks, Yash. And thank you for throwing in a, an interesting and new dimension to the discussion. Uh, though it's always somewhat sad that, that SACU is, is our precious customs union is treated as, a, as an afterthought in most uh, trade policy debates in South Africa. Um, but yeah, you, you're right to ask the question. Um, you know, formally, in terms of the new SACU agreement, uh, the, the SACU Council of Ministers and the SACU Tariff Board are effectively supposed to replace the role that ITAC currently plays in advising on and making trade and tariff policy decisions for um, the entire customs union. Um, that hasn't happened. Um, largely as a result of a gentle person's agreement that the, the smaller SACU member countries, so Botswana, Lesotho, uh, Namibia, Eswatini, um, will not interfere with or insist on being involved in tariff policy decisions in SACU uh, for as long as South Africa does not disrupt or force through any change in the SACU revenue sharing formula on which these countries depend for a, a very big chunk of their overall government revenues. Um, but this stalemate points to a more interesting or deeper tension um, within the customs union. Um, that in most cases, the, the smaller SACU members don't have productive capacities in many of the areas in which or on which trade or tariff policy decisions are making. So in, in raising the tariff, there's a, a clear and obvious impact or adverse impact on consumers with not the same subsequent or consequent benefits to producers um, in these countries. Um, on the other hand, you know, given the strong dependence of all of these countries on SACU tariff revenues, they all have a, 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 an inherent interest um, in defending the, the tariff. Um, they have a perverse interest in, um, in terms of the revenue that they gain um, from any increase in customs union in the customs union. So there's a, a, a nasty, nasty conflict of, of political economy interests um, for policymakers sitting in Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, and Eswatini. So yes, I mean you you, you raise a good question, and you know, going forward, you know the impact of of any trade policy decisions, tariff policy decisions, um, do need to consider you know the, the wider impacts um, that these changes might have on consumers and producers um, in the the BLNE. Um, but activating the SACU Tariff Board, the SACU Council of Ministers, is very unlikely to be effective currently until or unless we are firstly able to revisit, revise, adapt, change the existing revenue sharing formula, 
um, divorcing um, the extreme dependence that the Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, and Eswatini have on customs duties that are effectively collected on imports into South Africa, and so that we um, break that conflict of interest between tariff policy and um, government revenue. And secondly, and you know, learning from the discussion that we've had today, um, you know, there's clearly significant changes that need to be made in terms of the mandate in which tariff boards or tariff authorities operate within the region, um, in terms of how decisions are assessed um, to ensure that we consider both producer and consumer interests, to ensure that we consider the wider e economy-wide impact of tariff decisions, to ensure that we consider the interaction between these various instruments, tariffs and other defense instruments, and in the SACU case, to ensure um, that we can consider or assess uh, the different interests of different countries. So, yeah, a lot to consider. Um, it's it's encouraging to hear that um, Ibonga and ITAC are already grappling with some of these issues. Um, but until we have resolved some of these internally, I think it would be dangerous to throw these at a, a SACU wide institution. Thanks, Yasha. I'll leave it there. Perfect. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, what I want to do now, we are formally at the end of our scheduled time, um, uh, but uh, I, unfortunately, we have had to say goodbye to Sfiso. So, uh, Ayavonga is available for another five or, or so minutes, um, Matthew as well. So I, I would like to just open up to the audience um, to see if there are any follow-up questions for either the panelists or for the presenters um, before I hand back to uh, Ayavonga to provide final comments. Um, Matthew to also provide final comments and as, as well as the presenters. Um, any questions from the audience? So we don't have any hands up yet, Yash, but we do have a couple in the Q and A. Um, it's more a, a comment, and it says: Surely the risk of global price fluctuations is a red herring. Firstly, because fluctuations go both ways. Secondly, because the exchange rate absorbs most of that. Thirdly, because farmers and importers can hedge these risks. So more a comment than a question. Then I, I see um, one hand raised. Um, yeah, one hand has just been raised. <laughs> so this is um, Tim Zili. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Thanks. Um, I'm from the uh, Fair Play Movement, and I just wanted to pick up on what Ayabonga and Zufisa were saying about economies of scale. And in my opinion, on the danger of the narrative, the trade defense measures are somehow bad for consumers only. Um, I don't think we can ignore the macro context. Agriculture is the most heavily protected industry in the world, right? There are virtually no countries that do not rely on trade defense measures to support their agricultural industry. If we look at Brazil as an example, until the early 2000s, US and European multinational corporations dominated Brazil's meat and feed grain industry. It was only until 2007, between 2007 and 2013, so fairly recently, that Brazil implemented its national champions policy, um, which the idea was to select certain companies and transform, transform them into large multinationals that would bring home significant revenues. So now we are in a situation where JBS is the world's largest producer and exporter of meat. It sells to over 150 countries. It's the most efficient producer of poultry in the world. Five million people are employed in Brazil's poultry industry, and it's achieving a 26% year-on-year growth. It achieved this economy of scale with government incentives and trade defense measures. So here's the logic. Lower production costs lead to lower consumer costs. Economies of scale lead to lower production costs. Economies of scale, can, uh, economies of scale are dependent on trade defense measures amongst other incentives. So there seems to be a direct and logical link between lower cost to consumers, at least in the long term, and the imposition of trade defense measures. I was wondering whether anyone in the panel would like to comment on this. Um, um, all right, uh, thanks very much for that, that question slash comment. Um, uh, I'll, I'll pass on to, to either of the panelists or the presenters to see if they want to respond to that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll start with Neva because I, I know she has Thank a hard you. cut of, uh, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, Neva, I, I don't know if there's any direct response to, to Tim's question or uh, anything that has been raised by any of the panelists. 
I think just to say, and as as well as closing comments, if you have any. Yeah, nobody's denying that there's costs as well as benefits to any trade measure. That's the whole point. Is that I think the that my feeling is that some of the costs, particularly to working class communities, have historically not been well have in the last ten years not been taken adequately into account. And I can say also more generally. There is an issue here about creative destruction and how we think about that. That how do you know if an industry that's asking for tariff protection is actually just never going to become competitive or if it's actually an infant industry or an industry that can recover and actually join in as a, you know, as a industry that will provide goods to South Africa and to the world at a competitive price. And my real concern is that, and I think this is where Ayobongan's like he says, they want to upgrade the process. If you don't have a really rigorous effort to look at the costs and benefits to consumers as well as producers, that the risk is you end up just anytime an industry is going under, it lobbies for a tariff and we end up giving them a tariff. And you can actually see that in the master plans. As far as I can see, every single master plan started with relatively large producers saying, we need a tariff because we can't compete with imports. Rather than saying, we need support from government so that we can produce more efficiently so that we can, can compete with imp imports. So yes, there may be a need for tariffs in, for many infant industries, even for very long periods, but it shouldn't become the main fallback for industrial policy or the first fallback for industrial policy. Because effectively you end up with a long-term su subsidy from the rest of society for industries that may never be able to compete without it. And it ultimately the risk is if you do it on a large scale, you end up raising, costs across the economy relative to other countries, and that's going to harm maybe all industries, not just the industries that are protected. And so oddly enough, many people know I'm very interventionist when it comes to the economy in many ways, but I think we need to do it rationally. And the tariffs should always be the second best. It doesn't mean you never do them, but what we really want to do is what are the supply side measures that will raise productivity? So for instance, with poultry, how can we bring down the price of feed? No? With sugar, you know, is the best place to produce sugar around KZN or is it in Mpumalanga or other places with more rain, rainfall? You know, or is that an industry where really if Iswatini can produce it cheaper, that's where the regional development division of labor becomes important. Those are the kinds of questions I think we need to ask, not just instantly say, oh my goodness, this industry is in trouble because of high imports, cut off the imports. No? Because I think that's quite a dangerous path to go down if we do it on scale. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, I'm 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 gonna uh, put a hard touch off of of quarter past one for for the session. Um, Ayabonga, last comments from your side, if any. Yeah, maybe just briefly. Let me just come in to you know the point that Tim is raising um, on on scale economies, and I think I'd made the point earlier on that um, part of the industry level restructuring that needs to happen, um, which we certainly hope with the levers we have. Um, and of course the tariff might be the entry point because people love the tariff, but that's why these conditionalities become so important because the conditionalities are not only just focused on retention of employment, but it's also about undertaking the supply side investment that gives rise to industrial upgrade um, alongside all of the other demand side interventions in our trade policy aimed at accessing new markets, the AFC, FDA, and so on. Um, so we have to see it like that, or else we're going to get stuck in the molecular or granular level of just the instrument itself, the distributional outcomes of the instrument, the welfare outcomes of the instrument, outside of all of the other issues that interface with it. And I think similarly, we must caution. Um, against you know, the same type of approach insofar as our discussion on pass-through is concerned. Uh, because on the one hand, um, you know, I'd be interested to understand whether or not as a result of the, um, um, you know, the uh, pause on some of the anti-dumping duties uh, that were proposed uh, over the last year or so, whether or not we've seen a commensurate retail price response that corresponds to the graph that we were seeing there on tracking the pass through. Um, because we kind of have to see both sides. Um, and, and I'm quite interested in the discussion continuing. Uh, because as I said earlier on, I, I don't think there's a need for a 
uh, an antagonistic discussion here when we're trying all to find what are the complementary set of measures that can get us the types of outcomes that we want. Um, and I think we're all, you know, uh, together in relation to what those outcomes are, um, you know, uh, deepen industrialization, protect jobs, uh, uh, maximize investment in some of these critical sectors uh, so that we're able to resolve all of these other problems that we have um, in our country. Uh, maybe just the last comment, um, which, which I think might be important to consider. I do think that the interface between much of this work that is happening analytically or otherwise um, in academia and outside of it, um, we'll need going forward to, to have a much stronger interface with industrial policy broadly defined, not just some of the work we're doing at an ITAC level. Um, and I think we need to probably debate on that. Uh, maybe just a last comment. Um, I think, Dr. Matthew Stern, we can maybe have a chat on, I guess, um, uh, where we are in relation to the SACO issues. Uh, there are areas where I agree, but I do think some of the you know, characterizations there of where we are in the process are a bit unfair and unfortunate. Um, and we can certainly have that discussion. But thank you so much. Really, as I said, a constructive and a helpful discussion. Um, and I certainly hope it's the start of May. Thanks a lot, Yash. Ayabonga, uh, thank, thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, just in case uh, I, I do miss it, just uh, again, thank you very much to, to the presentation presenters and the panelists for, for a generous contribution of their time and effort. Uh, I'll pass on to Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence, I don't know if there's any closing remarks on your side. Um, and, and then last but not least again, for the last time today, uh, I'll pass on to Matthew after that. Lawrence? Hi. <clears throat> no, I don't, I don't think I have much more to contribute. Um, I think it was very interesting. Lots has, has been said. Um, I'm always inspired by the optimism of uh, policymakers, and they have to be. Um, but I'm often uh, disappointed by the reality of uh, what drives these processes. I, I think our tariff policy at the moment is reactive. It's not proactive. So the alignment between industrial policy and trade policy is an important consideration. But a reactive policy isn't the link between the two of them. So trade policy predominantly seems to be driven by protection of jobs, facing of competition. It's not about the scale economies that Tim has spoken about. And the link between those, I think, is critical. And that's about exports. And I, I think Ibonga's point about the importance of policy to enable competitive industries, which in my view is about enabling them to export, because that's a measure of competitiveness. That's much more the focus that we need to be thinking about. And how do we use trade policy with industrial policy to create new competitive industries rather than protecting potentially inefficient industries? And so I think there's a framework we need to rethink about how we look at these issues and these interactions to create um, competitive uh, industries. I think that was just following a very interesting and, and insightful discussion and presentation from all presenters. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Um, Matthew, last inputs from your side? Um, and mm -hmm. I, I, then I'll give very brief closing remarks after. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Yash. And, and thanks, Ayabonga. Um, as you may have picked up, Saku is a pet obsession of mine, so I'll always be ready and <laughs> available to chat. Uh, but reflecting on the conversation, um, I mean, I, I think what today has served to highlight is you know, a lot of that underlying tensions and or, or trade-offs that we're all aware of between um, you know, consumers and producers in the South African economy and the, and, and the, the critical and extremely difficult role that ITAC has to play as the, an independent arbitrator uh, between these, these, these different interest groups. Uh, but I think it's also you know, reinforced the point that yeah, ITAC cannot operate in a, in, in a vacuum. ITAC operates um, within um, a, a policy space. Um, and you know, a lot of the discussion, you know, in, in my view, has raised questions around whether we need to sort of relook or rethink or at least revisit our, our overall approach to, to trade and industrial policy. And particularly, particularly the extent to which our know, existing policy can address you know, the, some of the, the key underlying structural constraints that you know, are faced by all producers um, in this economy, many of which have been you know, raised by the presenters, but also by um, the industries um, that's at, at the table today. Um, and you know, the, the hard reality that you know, addressing those constraints is, is, is tough and requires you know, concerted policy action, um, uh, but we, you know, we can't avoid those hard policy choices and we can't continue to you know, rely or, or, or turn to ITAC um, to address you know, the, these, these serious uh, underlying structural issues um, through you know, short-term stopgap um, tariff-related measures. Um, you know, thanks, Yash, and thanks, everyone. <laughs>
Perfect. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, and uh, once again, th thank you very much to the presenters and the panelists. Um, maybe just very brief closing remarks from my side, then I'll hand over to, to Margaret to, to just give us a, a kind of last minute rundown on, on the more housekeeping issues. Uh, I, I think what's come, come out quite clearly is, is there are obviously very clear trade-offs with, with any tariff policy and the use of tariffs, um, whether or not it's your general tariffs or your kind of more safeguard and anti-dumping measures. Um, uh, but I think what's come out quite clearly is that they often disproportionately impact negatively on the poor. The, the other key thing I think is, is and, and what's come out today is there's been obvious issues around ITAC processes historically, but I think a clear acknowledgement from the ITAC commissioner himself that there is um, initiatives underway to improve these processes and to improve transparency around these processes. And that's, I think, is a positive message. Um, it, the, there is obviously, again, what's come out quite clearly, a need to look beyond just tariff policy to address what are sector systemic or structural issues. Um, and uh, I think uh, Ayabonga, uh, as well as Lawrence um, and, and Matthew, uh, put it quite nicely, it, it's, it often relates to a complementary set of measures or interventions that are, are needed to address the underlying causes of um, limited competitiveness of some industries. Um, and, and so we need to look beyond just tariff policy. Uh, last message, uh, I think what comes out most clearly out of all of this is that we do need further engagements on this. Uh, and I hope this is where URSA will, will come in and, and provide the platform for these future engagements. Thank you very much for everyone. And, and thanks again to all of the attendees um, for providing their inputs, for providing their time um, and, and making this a, a worthwhile initiative. Thanks again, and I'll pass over to Margot. Cool. Thank you, Yash. And not to go on more about it, but in addition to thank you for being such a great chair and to DNA Economics for helping us organize such a lovely event. And just they have having questions, this will all be available on YouTube and our website after the fact. Please do also complete the feedback form just so that we can take your feedback for next time. And we will definitely take these points and let you know about future initiatives we have. So have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. And Till next time. Thank you.